Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for each individual that can make it tonight. Uh, we just we thank you for their opportunity to serve your children, Father, their service, the way they committed their lives, Father. We just we continue to give you thanks for each and every leader in Bethel Kids. I pray tonight as we talk about the heart of the leader that you would just make this conversation fruitful, that you would help it to uh, speak to each one of our lives, each one of our hearts, Father. We just pray uh, for freedom. We pray for uh, bondage being broken in our lives as we talk about the importance of understanding who we are and how you have shaped us. So we give you this evening, we give you this time. In your precious name, amen. All right, well, thanks for coming tonight. Um, we have had, this is our fourth meeting this year, uh, talking about the heart of the leader or leadership in general. And uh, this one is going to be our wrap-up on the heart of the leader. So harsh portions of this, if you haven't come to any of the other meetings, don't worry about it. Um, they're, I have them recorded, and they're on my blog, um, which I can send you a link if you like. But also, we'll, we'll do a little recap tonight uh, to go over some of the things that we've already talked about, uh, just so we can bring everybody to speak. Because we haven't met since... Like July or August, right? Right. Yeah, it's it, it seemed more recent than that to some because we had another meeting that not everyone came to that was uh, a, a long all day Saturday thing. So um, I, I want to just kind of lay the foundation for where we're working from in this session uh, that goes to the core leadership beliefs that we have already taught. But I just want to reinforce this: if you've gone through Bethel Connect previously, this will make sense to you. Or if you've gone through Redemptive Leadership of Pastor Glenn, this will also uh, reinforce it to you. So uh, the first one is that the heart of the leader directly impacts his or her ability to lead. Everything flows from what is inside, right? And, and, and you guys have heard this before, I'm sure. Uh, if there's junk on the inside, when you get squeezed, what comes out? Junk. The heart of the leader directly impacts his or her ability to lead. That's why we spent so many times talking about the heart of the leader. Because we lead... Not just out of skills and expertise, but we lead out of who we are. And so if you are, um, if, if you're not moral on the inside, you're not going to be a moral leader. That's why, you know, oftentimes people like to define leadership by somebody that gets something done. Uh, and the challenge with that, uh, it, leadership has to be more than just accomplishing a task. Because if it's not, otherwise... Um, Hitler was a phenomenal leader, but he was not a moral individual, was he? He did not accomplish good things. He is not a phenomenal leader because of the lack of morality. Same thing with us. We cannot lead well. We cannot lead well if we have junk. And one of my favorite, uh, favorite phrases that I heard recently uh, is that a leader that does not deal with their stuff will eventually inflict their stuff on others. So that's why we spend time talking about the heart of the leader and the importance of that, so that way people can understand this as a core value. Tell Pastor Joel to shut the interior doors, not the exterior doors. The exterior doors lock. So the second element of that is that the heart of the leader sets the tone for the organization. So if the leader leads from a position of paranoia, anger, Whatever it is, whatever's inside that leader, that's going to set how the employees experience the organization. That's going, to, that's going to impact how the individuals that are involved in the organization interact with other people. Uh, children's ministry is a wonderful example of this. Because children's ministry can have a tendency to be a very rule-based ministry. Would you guys agree with that? Yeah. Yeah. It's everything is this way, everything is, and part of it is for safety. There's certain rules that we have that are always in place. Like um, if you work in children's ministry, we want to, we, we we run a background check on you. It's required. But we also have rules that say we have individual grades. But if we have a second grader that wants to go with their third grade sister because it's their first few weeks here, what do we tell them? Now the rule says they go to their own class, right? But we want to be an organization that is welcoming to parents and to children. Because we talked about our, our overall value is that we serve children, we serve parents. So when we say that, what do we do? We'll break that rule. Why? Because we want to be gracious. We want to be accepting. We want to be welcoming so that we can serve parents and serve children. So there's red rules and blue rules. 
And depending upon the tone of your organization, will it really depend upon whether you have all red rules or whether you have some grace in those and uh, there's some opportunity for rules to bend and sometimes break. Uh, but everyone gets a background check. Red rule. Nothing changes with that, right? But all of that's going to come from the leader. If the leader says there is no flexibility, what are the followers going to say? There is no flexibility. That's why the heart of the leader sets the tone for the organization. The organizational culture, which is created by that tone, directly impacts the way that people experience the organization. So, think of Chick-fil-A. We've talked about Chick-fil-A as a great example of this before. They want to be an environment that welcomes and is uh, service-oriented. So when people come in, they're very, I mean, they are, uh, they are on point when it comes to serving people. When you say thank you, what do they say? My pleasure. That's right. Why? Because they want to be welcoming. It affects your experience because that comes down from the top. The organizational culture, the organizational culture impacts the way people experience the organization. So that goes true in the CDC, that goes true in the nursery, that goes true in preschool and elementary. If we want to be gracious, welcoming, and affirming for people that come in, guess what? We have to act that way. Otherwise, when people come in, they don't have a good experience. And this is why this is all, all three of these are so very important. Because ultimately, the way people experience the organization directly impacts the organization's ability to fulfill its mission. So if we want to be a welcoming organization, if we want to say, or ministry, if we want to say, we want your children to come and be a part of what we're doing here. But when they come in, we make it so difficult for somebody to sign in or we make it so that they have to jump through four or five different hoops to even get through the doors are we going to be able to fulfill our mission no no and it's the same thing in the way we teach kids it's like when i first got here uh, to bethel it was it was so very interesting to me um, the philosophy of ministry was a little bit different um, it was we're here to teach kids which we still teach kids Understand, one of the ways that we serve children is by teaching in a fun, biblically-centered environment that is safe. This is one of the things that we do. It's very important. But we also, one of the things that we added was an element of grace. Because before I got here, it was, it was, it was, it was so very bizarre, and I'm not trying to disrespect anybody that was here prior to me, but you'll understand that to, in my mindset, it was such a, an odd setting. Uh, kids would actually get suspended from coming to kids' church. And it was weird to me, because that's not a welcoming environment, that's not a service environment. And it changes the experience for everyone here. Now, I understand we have some kids, we had some kids that were very difficult, but we all, one, one of the things that I shifted with, the, with these kids when we're having trouble, you know what, we'll do better next week. We give everyone an opportunity to do again. Why? Because that's the experience that we want people to have in the organization. That's the experience. But where does that have to flow from? It flows from the top down. It flows from the top down. For teachers that asked kids not to return because they were on suspension, was that the teacher's fault? No, they were, they, were, they were acting on instructions of leaders. So when we talk about the heart of the leader, I want us to understand that that's the absolute foundational piece for any kind of leadership. And I believe that anyone that's serving in ministry is a leader. It doesn't matter whether you are working check-in. It doesn't matter whether you work in play center. It doesn't matter whether you're leading a small group. Everyone that's functioning in ministry, in my mind, is a leader because if we look at the statistics, what does it tell us? It tells us that 80% of the work in a church is done by 20% of the body. And I think when you're in the top 20%, it makes you a leader automatically. So this is important for all of us. And we've talked about many elements of uh, the heart of the leader. We've talked about the, the essential parts of emotional intelligence. We've talked about understanding your history. We've talked about uh, developmental challenges that we've all faced in life. Tonight, we're going to talk about three disciplines of self-leadership. Of self-leadership. That's what we're going to talk about this evening. We've already talked about one of them, so I'm just going to recap that real quick in self-awareness. So the three disciplines are self-awareness, self-management, and self-development. Self-awareness is uh, essentially, we, we talked about that one tonight, so just a quick recap. It's being aware of your feelings, being aware of your motivations, being aware of your history, 
being aware of your tendencies. We all have things that we like to do. We all have, we all have a, it's kind of like in prayer. Now I'm, gonna, I'm going to, um, I'm going to say something here that will change forever. How do you listen to somebody pray? Are you ready for that? Everybody that prays has a rest phrase that they use. Some people like to, every time they take a breath, they say, dear God. Or they say, Heavenly Father. Or they say, Father God. Now, every time you listen to somebody pray, you're going to hear this. You're I'm sorry, I ruined it for all of you. Uh, we had a youth pastor that, um, his rest phrase was Father God. Uh, we're growing up. And uh, we counted one time in a prayer on a Sunday night. It was probably, you know, your typical two-minute prayer just before the offerings. He said Father God like 45 times. So, I'm sorry. Uh, and now you'll be listening to yourself pray, right? We all have tendencies, but most of us go to those tendencies because we're not aware of them. We don't know about them. And self-awareness is when we start working on understanding our motivations, understanding our tendencies, understanding the things that we do. And this is an important element of self-leadership. The second part of self-leadership is uh, self-management. Now, like I said, we just recap self-awareness because we talked about that previously. Is self-management. Here's some of the things that we need to make sure that we, we are managing. We need to manage our feelings. I read an article yesterday that found that sadness and depression is the longest lasting feeling. Somebody, when you get that feeling, it is the most extended feeling in your life. Now, is it wrong to be sad? No. Is it wrong to have a time of depression? No. It's being aware of these times. That goes back to uh, self-awareness. Manage your feelings. Manage your anger. Manage your hostility, grief, loss, fear, bitterness. Here's why it's so important to manage our feelings. Because feelings are fickle. And they're fleeting. They come and go. They feel so very valid at the time. And they may be when we're having that experience. But the reality is, sometimes our feelings can get us into trouble. Have anybody ever gotten into trouble because of their feelings? Or your kids, um, I, I don't want to do that. Why not? Because I don't feel like it. Yeah, yeah, it's not going to work, is it? There's times when we have to supersede our feelings. We have to supersede our feelings and move forward in what we know, not just in what we feel. So, but in order to do this, we have to be aware of it, and then we have to manage it. Am I, am, are we saying not to have emotions, not to have feelings? No, not at all. Jesus had emotions, didn't he? Jesus had feelings, very deep feelings, deep, very deep emotions. But it's important to understand the appropriate time to use them, appropriate time to let them out, appropriate time to hold them in. Um, Susan Scott's got a great book. It's called Fierce Conversations. And it talks about how you have a difficult conversation. And one of the things that she points out in there is that it is okay to express your emotion. But it may not be okay to show your emotion. There's a difference between I feel angry and yelling at the top of your lungs at somebody. And that is a, a very important part of self-leadership is understanding how to manage your feelings, how to manage those things. The other thing that we need to manage, and this is a hard thing for uh, many of us, it's managing expectations. You know, uh, I like to tell everyone that works with kids, if you don't have a plan, they will. So it's true on expectations. Everyone has some form of expectation. You might have an expectation of yourself that you feel like you're not fulfilling. Or you might have an unrealistic expectation on yourself. I've told Heather before that, yeah, I'm not really happy unless I'm doing the work that three people should be doing. It's, and it might be an unfair expectation on myself sometimes when I feel like I'm not doing enough, like I need to do more. That's not always a right feeling. It's an expectation I might have on myself that's unrealistic. Uh, the other thing that we have to manage is uh, others' expectation of you. It could be friends, it could be family, it could be uh, peers, it could be... I mean, how many have uh, ever experienced the, the guilt of, oh, you're going to leave now? We still have more work to do. It's that expectation. People have expectations of you. How many of you have experienced that? Yeah. Yeah. The other expectation is uh, the leader's expectation of followers. This has been a hard one for me. Um, 
because I have a tendency to, and this is one of the things I've had to manage in myself, is I've had the tendency in my, early on in my ministry career to have the expectation that everyone's going to work like I work. But I jokingly said, and I, and I mean it, is that work is my hobby. So not everyone has that same, that same feeling, that same mentality, that same approach. I'm not necessarily saying I'm right or they're wrong, but there can be a challenge if we put our expectation of what we expect for ourselves on those that are following us. Now, there are certain ways that that's appropriate, you know, in morality and uh, in commitment, but there's times that that expectation we put on followers uh, is entirely inappropriate. It's entirely inappropriate. And we have to learn it. We have to learn those three kinds of expectations to manage. The expectation we have on ourselves, because sometimes we give ourselves unrealistic expectations. We have to realize uh, that others' expectations of us are not always valid. Uh, so have to do, you don't have to answer this because it's being recorded so they can see it. But how many of you have a, a parent, mother or a father, that uh, you, you, you walk away from every conversation with the feeling that you are a, a phenomenal disappointment because you're not meeting their expectations? It's, it's as, as, as an adult, even as an adult, our parents' expectations of us can have an incredibly positive or negative impact on us. We have to manage these things. We have to be aware of these feelings and how it affects us. And this is where we're working towards in our self-leadership is understanding ultimately whose expectations we need to be meeting. And then the third element that we're talking about for expectations, you know, if you are leading a group, you have to understand, are your expectations on that group unrealistic? In self-management, there's, there's elements that we have to work on. Staying healthy, staying mentally vibrant, adequate sleep, proper diet, adequate exercise, daily dose of positive human contact. This has been an important part of life. Um, Rick Warren has a great uh, training on small groups, and he talks about every small group has an EGR. You know what the EGR is? Extra grace required. The person that requires extra grace. And he says, if you can't identify who it is in your group, it may be you. But understand that in life, we come in contact with people that they are just leeches, right? They're emotional leeches. And it's okay to be able to feed in to help them, but if we don't get a daily dose of positive human contact, What's eventually going to happen? Eventually, we're going to start reflecting back those feelings. You can only stay around negative people for so long before you become a negative person. I had a, a friend one time, and uh, he didn't appreciate the comment, but that's okay. Uh, I just I told him, I said, you know what? I need to spend less time with you. I, my, my mood is so much better when I'm not with you. And he looked at me and said, you're just negative all the time. And uh, it was a true story. I mean, true. it was a, a true statement. The less time I spent with that person, the better off my attitude was. It's not because of them, per se. It's because of the way their attitude and the way I was reflecting their attitude. Positive context, so very important. Uh, mental recreation. Read a book. Come on. It's, we're, we're really tight tonight. Are we okay tonight? We, we doing all right? Mental recreation. You okay back there, J.D.? Yeah. Okay, all right. Mental recreation. Challenge yourself to think differently. Challenge yourself to work on your mental exercise, whether, the, whether that is reading a book, whether that is learning something new, uh, whether that is uh, mental recreation. Uh, I, I have found when in times of great stress, there's times that my mental recreation, I have to go build something. I have to go think. Uh, it's, it's honestly a funny story. It's how I learned how to juggle. Uh, when I was working in college, I would spend so much time studying for final exams and stuff and papers that I needed to give myself a break. And the recreation I was was practicing how to juggle. And that was enough. Five, ten minutes of juggling was enough to help my, my brain relax. Because recreation should be fun, right? Should be fun. And so I gave myself time to relax. Mentally, I was able to uh, get in there. The other thing is thinking time. Give yourself thinking time. Uh, many of us cram our, our schedule so packed 
that um, we don't give ourselves a break. And eventually, if we don't manage to, uh, if we don't manage to build these things into our life, what happens? We burn out. We burn out. Some have a, a longer capacity for burnout. Um, I, I figured out I can manage um, a very busy schedule for, you know, six to eight months before I'm like, okay, I just need to take a week off. Uh, but if I don't manage it, what happens is I'll push through that six to eight month period. And then I'll find myself a couple months down the line, and I'm just cooked. And then I'm no good for like three or four weeks. That's no good, is it? And some people never recover from the burnouts. Some people burn themselves out so far that they never recover. So these are important self-leadership, is this management. The, uh, the third part, and I'm going to go through this a little quick so we can get to the last piece I'm going to talk about. Um, the third piece is self-development. Self-development. These are important things for us in self-leadership. We have to be lifelong learners. We have to be lifelong learners. There's an unlearning curve. There's an unlearning curve of things that we thought we knew that sometimes are incorrect. Sometimes are incorrect. Some of the hardest lessons I've had to learn is when I've had to acknowledge, you know what? I got that wrong. My thinking was wrong. But it takes an intentional effort and desire to be able to do that. Uh, getting to learning networks, this is a good opportunity to hear. Uh, our class is on Wednesday night, and I realize that for those that teach Wednesday evenings, um, it's hard to make a deeper class. But build accountability groups, get in fellowship, get in opportunities to talk with people uh, that are going to challenge you. Like I said, this is a great evening here, a great time of showing learning and the desire to grow. But you know what? It doesn't always have to be a formalized group of people. There's nothing wrong with getting together with three or four friends to do a Bible study that the church didn't put together. That, that's okay. It's all right to do that. Uh, build on your strengths. Understand what you are uh, good at. Understand where you uh, can grow and what you can contribute. What you can contribute to others. And then avoid burnout, which I already spoke about that just a little bit. Uh, ways that we can grow. Thank you, Pastor Joel. We can grow through failures. Admit the mistake, accept responsibility, make restitution, reassess the location, mourn your loss. This is an important part of uh, learning from a failure. Mourn the loss. Some failures are bigger than others. Small failures are wonderful ways to learn. Big failures are painful ways to learn. But if you pay attention, you have a wonderful opportunity in that failure to grow from it but sometimes where people get stuck is that they never mourn the death of a dream the loss of a vision and rather they decide to try and cradle it and see if they can revitalize it which it may happen eventually but they never move beyond the loss I've seen many people in ministry that a, a failure derailed them. Um, just from a personal experience, uh, the church that Heather and I were on staff at prior to coming here, uh, it, it, it went very, the, it, it ended very poorly, uh, to, to put it politely. Uh, and my brother-in-law asked me, he goes, is this why people leave ministry? And I looked at him and said, yeah, this is why people leave ministry. And for me, I had to learn an important part that a dream I had had for many years had to die in order for God to give me something better. But it was a painful lesson. A very painful lesson. But I had to mourn that. Uh, you have to move the closure, accept direction, and then establish new behaviors. Now, those are these are these are three elements of self-leadership. These are all, like I said, I, I went through them pretty quick because uh, I think some of them are very self-explanatory. But these three elements, self-awareness, self-management, self-development, as I was thinking about this, really, this is what brought me to kind of the core of how I want to wrap up the discussion about the heart of the leader. And I, I came to these three. They all lead to one piece in my mind. And I, I titled that self-belief. Self-belief. Here's the question, or here's the statement about self-belief. Self-belief is what do you believe about yourself. What do you believe about yourself? 
So we talked about managing expectations. We talked about managing your own expectations, the expectations of others. We've talked about your developmental history and how negative experiences in your life can have a positive impact if given the opportunity. But here's the challenge that we can face in life. And this comes to the core of the heart of leadership. Is that oftentimes, as we go through life, things stick. Positive things, negative things, they stick. And eventually, if something sticks long enough, you start to believe it. Whether it's true or not. And as I was thinking about and praying about how we're going to talk about this this evening, I decided to, um, to, to use a movie. We're not going to watch the whole movie. We're just going to watch some clips. Uh, but it's, I think it speaks so very well to expectations, belief, seeing more than there really is in front of you. So uh, we're going to do a few exercises as we go through this. So Pastor Dan and Chris, if you guys could uh, help me out here. Everyone needs uh, three pieces of paper. Three pieces of paper. If you didn't bring a pen or a pencil, Pastor Dan has a trash can of pens or pencils. Um, you can help yourself as you need so. Um, as we pass this out, let me talk a little bit about this uh, this idea of self belief. You know, um, so many truths that we hold on to in life um, aren't real. Some are. But think about, uh, I always use this as such a great example. I'm eventually going to have to find a different one, but this one works well for now. Think of somebody that grew up in the Depression era. Nobody in here looks like they are uh, old enough to have done that. But uh, those, one of the qualities of somebody that grew up in the Depression era is that they always uh, were incredibly frugal. Part of the reason for that, because their experience said there is not enough money. There is never enough food. There is never enough of anything. So when it comes time, even in times of prosperity, even in times of wealth, what do they believe? They believe there's not enough. It's like growing up in an abusive household or in an abusive relationship. Eventually, if somebody tells you that you're not good enough, that you're dumb, that you're not worth anything, that you have no value, eventually, you're going to believe it. Eventually, you're going to believe it. You know, I have a, a friend, um, I remember as we were teenagers one time, he was a big, big guy. I, mean, I know it's funny for me to say that, but he, you know, in eighth grade, he was six foot four, 300 pounds. His freshman year of high school, they moved him off of the uh, freshman football team onto the varsity football team because they were worried they were, he was going to kill somebody. But he was, he was a nice guy. He was one of the nicest people you would ever meet. But when he would get around other people, he would become, uh, for lack of a better term, he'd become a clown. He'd become just bumbling. And we, we went bowling one time with our youth group, and he... He could throw a 16-pound ball harder than I could throw a 10-pound ball. It was incredible. And, but he would go up there, and he'd throw it real hard, and then he'd, like, slip and fall. And he'd do it on purpose. I just finally looked at him and said, what are, you, what are you doing? He goes, people like me more like this. Because he was believing that he was so big and intimidating physically that he had to make himself seem less intimidating mentally. Was it true? But it was something that he believed. And it's affected him the rest of his life. He's uh, 38 now. And uh, he still acts that way. Still acts that way. And it's hard to watch somebody believe something that's false. And I think one of the things that really affects people most in that, um, goes back to the thing we talked about in self-management, is expectations. So let's watch our first clip here. And then we'll uh, we'll talk a little bit about it. the movie that we're we're pulling from. I don't know if you've ever seen it. 
Uh, it's Mr. Gregorian's Wonder Emporium. Anybody seen it? Uh, it's a great movie. Yes. Oh. It's, it's, a, it's a great movie. So, all right. So, since we're doing a leadership training here and not a film editing class, some of the clips jump a little quick, but I, tr I figured you guys could all follow it, okay? So, uh, here's our first one, and uh, then we'll talk about it. So, the beginning of the end begins with a chapter called Molly Mahoney's First. Molly Mahoney was the manager of the Emporium, Mr. McGorium's apprentice, and my only friend. In the mornings, Mahoney would play her piano, attempting to finish her very first concerto, but she never could find the right notes. expectation can lift us up or can weigh us down. Our own expectation can lift us up or it can weigh us down. So as we start, as we, we think about this, here's what I want you to do is ask yourself this question. What do we no longer believe? What do you no longer believe about yourself? Now, we did an exercise several months ago on creating a timeline of pivotal moments in your life. Those pivotal moments oftentimes represent when we stopped believing something. When we stopped trying to meet an expectation. Or when we stopped having a vision or a belief that we could do more. That we could be more. That God had something special and I think those times when we stop believing leave scars. And leave scars. And if we never ever think about it, if we never address it, what happens to a scar? It just gets tough. I had a friend had a uh, he had his appendix removed, and it was before they did things. Um, was it laparoscopically? And before that, they so he had a he had a scar that was that wide and that long around his side. It was huge, and it stood up like that on his side. And as he got older, it faded colors, but it never faded in size. It just got tougher. It's got tougher. It's like when I I I, I, I had I caught a racquetball racket one time in the lip. Um, not a good place to do it. Cracked my tooth. It was, it was horrible. I still have scar tissue in my lip. 
and I can still feel that hard spot in my lip. When we lose belief, that scar tissue builds up. And if you lose enough belief, it's hard to find the soft pieces anymore, isn't it? Our clip about Mahoney. As a kid, she had so much potential. Everyone had expectations, and she was meeting those expectations. But as she grew up, she lost belief. We could do that same thing. Now, life happens. Sometimes our expectations were unrealistic. But we should never lose sight of believing that we have the potential that we have the potential for more. But it's not always easy, is it? Because life happens. And why is it not easy? Because of other people. It's our, our next clip. Other people. Quick question. Quick one. Quickie. Hi. Oh, hey, Nancy. I need your help explaining this history that Mr. McGorium has fabricated. What history he's fabricated? This one I've got here, for instance. I've got a signed IOU from Thomas Edison. Really? P.S. Thanks for the idea of the picture of a light bulb next to it. Is that for real? No. No, it's it's not for real. It's a side IOU from Tom Edison. Does it seem like something that would exist in the real world, too? Well, it does have a signature on it. Hello? Please? Give me one second, please. Mahoney, wait. I just need a simple explanation. Sure. It's a magical toy store. Is there such a thing as a magical toy store? Of course there is. When you say magical, do you mean special? No, I mean magical. Unique? Magical. How about really, really cool? What's behind me, all right, is a toy store. It is a big one, it is a weird one, but it is just a toy store. I knew it as soon as I saw that suit. You what? You're a just guy. What's a just guy? A guy just like you. Same hair, same suit, same shoes. Walks around. No matter what, he thinks, oh, it's just a store. This is just a bench. It's just a tree. It's just what it is, nothing more. But this is just a store. I'm sure to you. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take about five minutes, and I want you to put five to ten on each list of what you believe about yourself and what other people believe about you. Positive, negative, doesn't matter to me. Positive, negative. Things that people believe about you or things you believe about yourself. 
It takes just about five minutes here. As you continue writing, um, you might be thinking that this is a little bit different than our normal kind of meeting. And, that, and that's true. This is a, uh, it's a little more of a feeling conversation about leadership. And uh, I think it's important that we, um, we keep in mind that leadership is an internal, is an internally driven Thing. You know, there's uh, there's plenty of books out there that talk about leadership as just a, a set of learned behaviors. Um, and there's truth in that. You know, that leadership is a set of learned behaviors that anyone can learn to be a great leader. But without learning how to deal with the interior challenges and emotions of yourself, um, you're you're going to be destined to repeat through the same cycle. Of, of leadership pitfalls and emotional challenges and relationship uh, barriers that you experience in life. That's why it's so important that we ask these questions of what do you believe about yourself? And I guess really the second sheet of what do you think other people believe about you is really probably a better way of saying it. But these things that we believe about ourselves and these things that we think other people believe about us will oftentimes affect what we do or affect our motivation for doing what we do. Heather and I really enjoy watching uh, West Wing on Netflix. Anybody, anybody remember that show on uh, early 2000s? Um, and they're, they're constantly putting, uh, they're running polls all the time to find out what people think. Find out what people think. Because it matters to them what people think. And if people think something negative, what are they going to do? They're going to change what they're doing so that people start thinking positive about them. We can do the same thing. And if we do it long enough, if we change our behavior long enough to please other people, eventually that will become who we are. Is it wrong to make other people uncomfortable? Is it wrong to make other people comfortable? No. Yeah. Uncomfortable. It's not always wrong to make them uncomfortable either. I'm good at making people uncomfortable in these kind of conversations all the time. Is it wrong to make other people feel at ease? No. Is it wrong to do something solely for the basis that it is easier for you emotionally than making a hard decision? Yeah, we call that emotional embezzlement, actually. When you make a decision that is easier for you rather than the right decision. This is so important for us in leadership. Emotional embezzlement or changing our behavior just so that people like us will affect your ability to be an effective leader. It's a hard conversation. It's a hard thing to realize. And there's things that I've had to realize in my life that some of the things I need to adjust are valid. Some of the things that I've tried to adjust aren't. Realizing what is and what isn't is important. That's hard. It all stems from what you believe. What you believe. How do you deal with others' doubts? How do you deal with your own doubt? Doubt isn't necessarily a bad thing. Some people like to say doubt is just a lack of faith. That's not true. Asking a question legitimately of God is okay. It doesn't show a lack of faith. It doesn't show a lack of faith. As long as we understand that God is God. We believe who he is. But we have challenges in that, don't we? We don't always understand why. Our understanding isn't always essential. In our own life, we have to start learning to accept that there's something beyond what we believe about ourselves and what other people 
believe about us. On that third piece of paper, here's what I want you to write. And then we'll watch our next clip. What God believes about me. What God believes about me. Let's watch our next clip. Will you my opinion? Come with me. Sir, hmm? I'm serious. What? I'm stuck. Ooh, to my floor? <laughs> no, sir. And what? Like as a person. You remember when I was a little girl and I could play rock now second piano concerto and everyone was talking about my potential? Mm -hmm. Well, I am 23 now and everyone's still talking about my potential. But if you ask me to play the song I know best, I'll still play Rachmaninoff second. May I suggest you stun the world with Molly Mahoney's first? I want to, but I am stuck. Come with me. This, my lovely, is for you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. What is it? It's the Congreve Cube. It looks like a big block of wood. It is a big block of wood, but now it's your big block of wood. Thank you. I was just saying last night I don't have enough big blocks of wood. <laughs> unlikely adventures require unlikely tools. Are we going on an adventure? Oh, my dear, we're already on one. All I will say is this. With faith, love, this block, and a counting Newton, you may find yourself somewhere you've never imagined. And with that, let's open the door. The doctors can't find anything wrong with you. Of course not. I'm perfectly healthy. Then why are you leaving? It's my time to go. That's it? What else could there be? What are we going to do without you? Run the store. Sorry, I don't know how. That's why I gave you the concrete cube. But it just sits there. What have you done with it? I don't know what to do with it. It's, it's a block of wood. Can you think of nothing? Oh, I'm sure I could think of a million things to do with it. There are a million things one might do with a block of wood. But Mahoney, what do you think might happen if someone just once believed in it? Sir, I don't understand. All right, if you're supposed to help me, if you're supposed to impart some great wisdom that's going to help me fix everything,
believes about you. So in the concrete cube, here's the question, what's the cube? If you had to take it in the context of what I've just said, what do you think the cube is? Anyone want to have a guess? Hmm? I guess an idol. No, no. The cube's a good thing. Well, you could be a cube. I think it's God's purpose for you. I think the cube is God's purpose for you. Oh. The question is, what's your cube? What has God called you to? And what does it take to get it moving? But oftentimes, our own belief hinders us from seeing what God has called us to. So I invite you, we're going to take a couple minutes here, look through that list. Write down kind of four or five things that says who, that from that list is what it says, who God says I am. Write down four or five things on your piece of paper that says, who does God believe I am? That's what I want you to focus on. Who does God believe I am? This list is so very important in my mind, um, going back to our discussion about feelings. Because sometimes our feelings don't line up with the Word of God, do they? God, I feel so alone. But God's never far away from us. God, I don't feel like I'm worth anything. The Bible tells us we're joint heirs with Christ. That God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son. And he would have sent his son just for you alone. God, I feel unloved. God, I don't feel good enough. I don't feel worthy. I don't feel, I don't feel, I don't feel. When our feelings don't line up with the Word of God, we have to choose to believe the Word of God over how we feel. And when we can start doing that, you know what we can start doing? We can start finding our cue, as it were. We can start finding our purpose as God has created us. But remember where we started at the very beginning of the night. <coughs> the heart of the leader directly impacts his or her ability to lead. Our belief comes from our heart. What have we allowed to hang on to us from the time we were a little kid to where we are now? That may or may not be true and may or may not line up with the Word of God. And that's the reality that we face as leaders. Those leaders that oftentimes think that uh, you have to be stern, you have to be harsh to be respected as a leader. It'd be fascinating to walk through their life to see what that looks like. Those that believe that leadership is all about being everybody's friend, it'd be interesting to walk through life. You know, we talked about the basis of leadership in Christianity. It's, it's Matthew 20, 28. That the Son of Man came to serve, but came not to be served, but to serve. That's the foundation for leadership in Christianity. That's the, that's the example that Jesus gave us. But oftentimes, we can lose sight of that because of the life that we grew up in, the family we experienced, the, the businesses, the, the jobs we've had, the negative experiences we've had in life, what's it do? They leave marks. We start believing. And if we don't learn how to cling to what God has said about us over what other people have said about us, we begin to reflect the negative things that other people have said about us. How many of you have ever gone to a, a carnival or a, um, a fair where there's somebody there doing caricatures? Yeah. You've seen them? You've seen the caricatures? You know what the caricatures do. You know why they, they look so... They, they work... I mean, they're, they're exaggerated 
versions of somebody. But what do they do? They find the most prominent feature on someone. And then they emphasize that. And so that it looks somewhat recognizable about that person. But it's like an exaggerated version. Sometimes we do that to other people. We find the, the most prominent feature about them, emotionally, relationally, and we turn them into a caricature. It's not really them, but it's the image that we carry around. It's the same thing that we can do to ourselves. We can create a caricature of ourselves. Maybe nobody realizes that you struggle with depression. Maybe nobody realizes that you struggle with anger. Nobody realizes you struggle with doubt. Maybe nobody realizes you struggle with feeling like you're alone, even in the midst of a room of people. And they might not realize that you define yourself by those things. We become a caricature. And when we become that, we lose sight of God's purpose. Because it's what we believe. That's why I think it's so important as we talk about the heart of the leader. As understanding that our heart is where we need to believe what God has created us to be. It's so important for us as leaders. Which brings us to our, our, our last clip. I am not here as a professional. I'm here as your friend. And I think you should keep the store. You don't even believe in the store. No, but... I, I can't. I want to, but I just can't. You just can't. Yeah. I guess not. What do you got there? Ah, uh, it's the concrete cube. It's supposed to help me unlock some great mystery or something. Looks like a block of wood. It is. Are you supposed to unlock a mystery with a block of wood? It's a magical block of wood, Newton. It's a block of wood, probably in the right hands, would reveal some greatness that we can't even imagine. That's impossible. This is what you don't understand. What you have somehow missed. Every minute of every day, in every corner of this store, what happened was the impossible. You want us to believe all that stuff? Yes. That this store was magic? You never saw it. That that block of wood is more than just a block of wood? Absolutely. I believe it with my entire heart. But the disheartening truth is that only Mr. Magorium could make it so. Um, it was his emporium, not mine. Just, uh... Look, I appreciate you coming here, but it's over. See that thing about that block of wood is not magic? It is magic. What is wrong with you, mutant? Say it one more time. That's more than just a block of wood. It is absolutely more than just a block of wood. Well, it moves for one thing. Move. <sighs> Come on, you can do better than that. Move. All right, don't worry. If you fall, I'll just pick you right back up.
Will you believe what he says? Or will you believe what other people say? Or even will you believe what you say? These are the questions. See, this is the, uh, the order that life can go through. We believe that we hurt or we grow up and we stop believing. Then we find that spark that God has placed in us and then we learn to let God be God. To let God be God. And here's why we know that God has more for you and why we need to learn to let him be God. Jeremiah 29, 11-13 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. The heart of the leader directly impacts his or her ability to lead. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. If you're not the block of wood, the block of wood is God's purpose for your life, though. Some of us take longer to find it. Some of us have to sort through what we believe about ourselves and what other people believe about us. So the trash can, it's real simple. And uh, what I invite you to do, those things that you think other people believe about you, and those things that you think you believe about you that don't line up with the Word of God, Let's just throw them away. Let's just throw them away. I was going to suggest we burn them, but we have a uh, smoke detector and fire alarm system in here and sprinklers, and I really didn't want to do that. But I want to throw them away. I don't want to hold on to them. I don't want you to hold on to them. I want you to let them go. So let's do this. I'll pray. Once I'm done praying, those things that you want to just let go of, that you just want to throw away, bring them up and throw them away. And then I, I think somebody brought cake, so we can have Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we, we thank you. We thank you because self-leadership is so very important in our lives. But even more than self-leadership, what we believe about ourselves and what you believe about us is more important. So as we, we've taken a few minutes tonight to, to write down those things that we believe about ourselves and the things that other people believe about, about us, I pray that you would help us to find freedom. The, the lies that we believe, that we've told ourselves, that the enemy has told us, that others have told us, I pray for freedom. I pray that we would break free of spiritual bondage, that we would let go of emotional hurts, and that the scars that have built up on the heart of each one of us would be softened. A softening that can only happen through the ministry of your Holy Spirit. This isn't a simple process. It's not even an overnight process. But I pray that you would teach us to hear your voice and to believe your word about who you have called us to be. And in doing so, we will learn to grow and to be the leader that you want us to be. I pray that we make you first in everything in our lives and that we give you glory for everything. In your precious name, amen.